of the 73 books in the Catholic version of the Bible, only two of them are written by non-Jews, both of them written by the same person, a guy called Luke. And he writes the Gospel of Luke, and he writes the Acts of the Apostles. In actual fact, they're basically just two parts of the same text, and they're both uh, kind of directed uh, to a man called Theophilus, who may have been a Roman governor, whom Luke was trying to persuade uh, Christianity is no threat to the Roman Empire, or else uh, the word Theophilus simply means somebody who loves God. So it's like anybody who loves God might be interested in the story about this character called Jesus. So in the end, in the Acts of the Apostles, he's summing up the, myst the, the mystery of Jesus and what happened after his ascension. Here's how it goes. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his, giving his chosen disciples further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time. And he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once, when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, when the disciples were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore the kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has authority to set those dates and times. They are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people everywhere about me, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up in a cloud while they were watching, until they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance of half a mile. When they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Here are the names of those who were present. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. These are words inspired by God. So my theme for October has been, I would call it adventure and returning home, or the hero's journey. So on October 6th, I looked at the, the leaving home part, leaving home on God's behalf, not just leaving home, but leaving home on God's behalf. And uh, last Sunday, the 13th, I talked about the nostalgia and coming back home. So today I want to do a recap of those two and then open up to a, a Q&A. So, the descent of Lila, the coming, leaving home on God's behalf. One of the best interpretations of Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, I've ever heard, was done by our own Lorraine Moore. When she talked about the story of where God allegedly made garments of skin for Adam and Eve after they discovered they were naked. And Lorraine's take on this was, it's not that God was trying to cover their nakedness or make up for their sin, but that the garments of skin represented the spirit become flesh, that God was offering them incarnation. He was creating space suits for these two souls. So it is about not, not about covering their nakedness or making up for their sinfulness, but about gifting them with space suits for incarnation. And John, in his beautiful prologue in his gospel, says exactly the same thing. He says, in the beginning was the Logos, the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. All things were created by Him, and without Him was made nothing that was made. In Him was life, and this life was the light of human beings. And the Word became flesh. The souls be began to incarnate. 
No, I think that this descent from guide right down to the ego, it goes in seven different stages, maybe many, many more, but seven main stages. That we start off as source. Ultimately, there is only God, the utterly transcendent, ineffable reality that we call God. That was kind of the first stage of the process. The second stage then is that God self, self fractures into souls. And this is the beginning of God's imminence, God's imminence, God as she appears throughout her creation. That was stage two. Stage three is that these souls, however, stay connected to God via the causal or the psychic body. And this is a kind of a spiritual version of entanglement theory that we get from uh, quantum mechanics. Stage four is that each soul then adopts a mental body. This is kind of Plato's ideal realm. It is the place of the archetypes. It is the place of ratiocination. We all have that level of body as well. Stage five is we then put on the astral body. And the astral body is the body that we inhabit when we're dreaming. It's the place from which our emotions are downloaded. And it's the place in which we experience parallel lifetimes, you know, even when, when we're awake, but certainly even when we're asleep. Stage number six is that we adopt the etheric or the energy template, the, the elan vital that you find in homeopathy or Eastern medicine, that energy system. And then finally, there's the physical body. We're at ground zero at that stage. Now, in the physical body, you know, we're, we're bound by time and space and matter and energy. But these do not exist and we get right down to the physical level. So at this stage now, we are subject to space and time, and matter, and matter and energy. And to make matters worse, we have amnesia for who we really are, where we came from, and what our mission is. So that is what the hero's journey looks like as we leave home on God's behalf. When we finally wake up and we realize who we are, who everybody else is, what our purpose is, what our mission is, what our true home is, and what the objective of the exercise is, then we begin the Ascension Project. And that's why I chose today's reading from the Acts of the Apostles, the Ascension of Jesus. It's a kind of a metaphorical or graphic account of what it looks like to ascend from our mere physicality back up through these various stages until finally there is unity with God. So I dealt with this then. I believe that the Ascension Project has four different tracks, and I'll mention what they are and then elucidate them a little bit. So the first, I call track one, is the, the, the individual story, the individual soul in the course of a single lifetime. That's one track. Track two is the individual soul over many lifetimes as we continually reincarnate. Track three is the evolution of the entire human race. And track four is the cosmos itself over the entire lifespan of the universe, how that continues to respond to God. So let me look at track one then, the individual soul in the course of a single lifetime. So our purpose in this particular lifetime is to awaken. It is to roll back the amnesia for who we really are. It is to recognize God, to recognize self and to recognize the other. And it is to remember the mission. That is the entire purpose of this incarnation in which we currently find ourselves. The second track then is the individual soul over many, many lifetimes, many, many incarnations. And uh, the notion of karma is really, really important for this. Karma is not a punitive mechanism whereby we are punished in subsequent incarnations for mistakes we made in previous ones. Karma is the life plan. Karma is the plan we made out with our divine mentors before we incarnated. So that when you arrive in a new body, in a new family, at a new stage of human history, when you wake up, you realize, this is exactly what I planned. So karma is not a punishment. Karma is really says, wow, I really got what I wanted. It's working out exactly the way I planned it would work out. Now, there are two outcomes from that. One is fate and the other is destiny. So fate happens when I misaligned with my mission. Instead of being in alignment with the karma that I planned for myself, I misaligned. I make all the wrong decisions for selfishness. And my fate is what happens at the end of that incarnation. And that's, you know, I'm going to have to deal with that subsequently. Destiny is what happens when I get it right. When I'm fully aligned in this incarnation, you know, with what I've planned. And it's in alignment with the mission I had in, in previous incarnations. Then the destiny is what arrives. So... We keep reincarnating until there is a full, permanent awakening, until every single one of us arrives at Christ consciousness. 
And I got a very pithy you know, definition of Christ consciousness a few months ago in a dream. I was asking for, give me a single statement on Christ consciousness. And I woke up in the morning and here's what I heard. heard. Christ consciousness is the permanent awareness of the inner divinity of all creatures. So you know, you know you've realized Christ consciousness when you are permanently aware of the inner divinity of all the creatures whom you encounter on planet Earth. You recognize the divine within each one of them. You can offer namaste to an oak tree or a bunny rabbit when you're Christ conscious. Track number three then is the journey of the entire human race. It was the uh, mission that Gaia signed up for. I had a very powerful vision many, many years ago where I saw souls volunteering in front of God for particular kinds of missions. And this one soul, whom I call Gaia, said to God, send me to that third rock from the sun in that particular solar system, and I will breed life, or life throw up a life form capable of recognizing its own divinity, and ipso facto, the divinity of all others with whom it shares the planet. In other words, the, the function of Gaia was to create what I would call a namaste species. A species which would recognize the divine in all other species. And that would be the end of war and the end of greed. It would be the movement from self-engrossed narcissism to compassion for all. That's track three, the uh, mission of the entire uh, human species. And track four then, the mission of the cosmos itself over the lifespan of the universe. And so it means, I believe, incarnating in other worlds, that souls would want to generate experiences, not sp just being, you know, three-dimensional beings on planet Earth, but actually incarnating in other worlds. You know, to become ourselves extraterrestrials or extra dimensionals, to join the higher orders of angels. And finally, to remember, you know, that we're nets would seem, we're, we're sparks of the divine itself. Now, I think then that we create as human beings, we create sacraments or rites of passage to help us understand and mark out that particular journey. So, sacraments then, our rites of passage, are about, you know, syncing nature with culture bringing them together, or the wedding of the god and the goddess in Celtic folklore. Um, uh, the gods are the kind of the, uh, the archetypes of uh, nature, uh, the goddesses, sorry, are the archetypes of nature, and the gods are the archetypes of culture. So it's where you bring culture and nature together. So it is a wedding of the cosmic and the individual. That's the journey of the cosmos itself. Now, a lot of great geniuses over time have created uh, mappings of this. What does this look like? What stages do we go through as we take uh, this journey? Shakespeare is famous for saying that there were seven stages in his great um, uh, drama, As You Like It. Uh, he says, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players, each one playing seven roles. First there's the infant and then the schoolboy and then the lover and then the soldier and then the justice, and then the retiree in his pantaloons, and then finally old age itself. So that was Shakespeare mapping of the human journey. The great uh, social psychologist Eric Erickson said it happens in eight stages of what he would call psychosocial evolution. Uh, so the first is, uh, uh, crisis is trust versus mistrust, and this occurs in infancy, from birth to about 18 months of age. So the little baby that newly arrived, can it trust the environment or is it mistrustful of the environment because of how it's being treated? That's the first challenge for every baby. Can I trust this environment? Can I trust this family? Or am I going to be abused in this family? Stage two is uh, autonomy versus shame and doubt. And this happens in toddlerhood from about 18 months to three years. Has to do a lot, particularly around potty training. Am I going to be abused because I've soiled my nappy? Or will mother and father understand? So will I develop autonomy and confidence or I'll be shamed and doubtful? It's the second crisis. The third one is, he called it initiative versus guilt. And this happens in the preschool age from about three to five. Again, how am I being kind of dealt with? How am I being parented? Am I allowed to show initiative or am I going to feel guilty about everything I do in, in the home? Stage four is industry versus inferiority. And this happens in the school age kids from about five to 12. So depending on how I get on in school, whether I'm being rewarded and regarded as a genius or a dullard, how will I, will I be an industrious person or I have a sense of inferiority and I won't even continue to, to keep trying. The next one is he called it identity versus role confusion. 
And this happens in the adolescence years between 12 and 18. Now at this stage, I'm trying to figure out who I am and what my function is in the world. Now, this is a very difficult time for most kids, and it's especially difficult now with the whole notion of transgenderism. They can't even figure out whether they're boys or girls, and they're being you know, pushed into kind of these kinds of uh, thinking. The next one is intimacy versus isolation. And this happens in young adulthood from about age 19 to 40. So now, am I going to meet a soulmate? Am I going to meet somebody with whom I fall, fall in love? Are I going to be isolated and unloved by anybody in a special way? The second to last stage is, he called it generativity versus stagnation. And this happens in middle adulthood from about 45 years to 64. So am I now kind of putting my energy uh, for, for others rather than just stagnating? I'm retired, I've given up on life rather than I'm being generous and generative, you know, by helping other people and the younger people particularly. And then the final stage he called Integrity versus despair. This is late adulthood from 65 years on. Have I maintained my integrity? Am I in alignment with my mission? I feel that my life has been useless. I've accomplished nothing. Nobody loves me. I'm on my own and I die in despair. So that was Eric Erickson's hit on it. Confucius had an interesting model. Confucius, who lived about 550 BCE, around the same time as the Buddha, he talked about five constant relationships. And he said, in fact, that the sense of separate self is actually an illusion created by the merging of these five relationships. So it is the relation between a husband and a wife, between parents and children, between elder brother and younger siblings, between teacher and student, and between the emperor and the subjects. And Confucius says, your entire sense of self is predicated on how you behave in these five relationships. Roman Catholicism will talk about the seven sacraments, the seven rites of initiation, beginning with baptism, then confirmation, then confession, then communion, then marriage, ordination, and the last rites. So again, uh, this is a way of stepping us through the great you know, periods of, of our lifetimes and having rites you know, that, that to celebrate that. The Kalenjin people, among whom I lived for 14 years, had three stages, uh, the birth, the warriorhood, and the elderhood. So there were extraordinarily beautiful ceremonies around the birth of a child, naming ceremonies. There was a very special ceremony when young boys were inducted into warriorhood. And then there was a special ceremony when the older warriors are now being inducted into elderhood. And the entire tribe celebrates these rites of passage. They're not just excuses for a party. They represent a change of tribal status of the initiated. And with this initiation came not just privileges, but also responsibilities. And often these ceremonies, these ritually and very realistically and frighteningly often involve some kind of a death phase where you're really pushed to the limit to find out whether or not you have the ability to go to the next stage. Now, I think I want to show then some different models of this Ascension project, starting with a two-stage model. I look at the quality of a magnifying glass and this extraordinary statement that Mary makes to her cousin Elizabeth now, when she visits her, she says, my soul magnifies God. And I could never understand that as a little boy. How could Mary magnify God? <clears throat> Mary, after all, even though she's the mother of Jesus, is a human person. How could a human person magnify God? Until I came across a magnifying glass that had fallen, the lens had fallen out of my grandmother's eyeglasses. And I started messing around with it. And firstly, I set fire to a newspaper. And then I set fire to straw in the backyard. And then I set fire to the cover of my father's motorbike, a BSA 250cc motorbike. And I really got it that, you know, this extraordinary orb, 93 million miles away, this sun, couldn't set fire to my father's motorbike on its own. It needed this piece of glass in order to kind of uh, concentrate the rays. And so in some senses, that is what Mary is saying. She is God's magnifying glass. So the first model I want to give then is that we have to become magnifying glasses for God. And a, ma a magnifying glass has two characteristics which are vitally important in order for it to work. The first thing is that it has to be clean. If it's smudged, then it won't focus the rays and it'll be useless. So cleanliness means the highest spiritual quality is the ability to see God in every being and in every event. So in the, uh, for instance, Jesus will say, blessed are the pure of heart for they shall see God. In some senses, that's actually, that's tautology because the pure of heart always see God and those who see God are always pure of heart. The Buddha said that very famously, just taking a flower off and people realizing that if you really saw a flower, 
you'd see everything. And Jesus would say, look at the lilies of the field. They're on spin, are weave, are gathering to barns. And yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his royal fine robes looked as good as one of these. And so the ability, purity of heart is the ability to see God in all situations. And the second important piece of a, a, a focal point is that the relationship, the, um, when you take a piece of glass like this, the, the focal length is really important. Unless you find the focal length, it's not going to work. So if, if it's too far away from that which you're trying to set fire to, the rays have the dispersed again and it won't work. If you're too close, they haven't concentrated sufficiently. So finding the focal length in every relationship is really important. And there are basically three, three focal lengths, mothering, othering, and smothering. Smothering is when you're too close to a personal relationship and they have no room for independence. Othering is you're distant and not involved. Mothering is finding the exact relationship at every stage of the relationship. So every one of us then is meant to be a mother of God, not a smotherer of God in the other, or an otherer of God in the other. So that's be a two-stage model. A three-stage model might look like, like this. Every one of us starts off with innocence, the total you know, acceptance of life as it is, the ability to be fascinated by everything around us, total innocence. At some stage in our late teenage years, the innocence is going to bifurcate. It's either going to become idealism or it's going to become cynicism. That's the problem. That's the bifurcation point that every single one of us is going to reach someplace in our adolescence or uh, early adulthood. And then some stage later in life, it's going to bifurcate again and it's going to go either into selfishness or to compassion. So there are the three great uh, model, stages in that model. There's a four-stage model as well that I love. And it's like... When Christ says, unless you become a little children, you won't even enter the kingdom of God. So what is it that Jesus sees in little children? That would allow him to say that. And there's four things I see. The first one is children's extraordinary sense of awe at life. They're fascinated by everything. The second one is their penchant for asking really, really important questions. The really deep questions. The third one is their ability to forgive even the parents who abuse them. And fourthly, that they're born prejudice-free. They have to be taught to be preju prejudiced. So becoming like little, like little children means stepping back into those again, being filled with awe at life, asking the really important questions, particularly of the oligarchs who are dangling uh, us. Thirdly, being able to forgive. And fourthly, being without prejudice, letting go of all the prejudices that our cultures induct us into. The six-stage model of it would look like this from the Gospel, the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. Thomas says, those who seek should not stop searching until they find. And when they find, they will be disturbed. And when they're disturbed, they will marvel. And when they marvel, they will rule. And when they rule, they will rest. So what is Thomas saying? He's saying that your job on earth is to roll back the amnesia and to seek the truth of who you really are. And when people are serious about that, they'll find the answers. But when they find the answers, they'll be really disturbed because they realize that everything they'd been taught by their parents, by the school system, by the politicians, by the churches was, in, was incorrect. It's an illusion. So now am I going to run back to mammy, hold on to her skirts, or am I going to have the courage to strike out and continue to, be, to continue with the hero's journey? If I continue with the journey, I'm going to marvel because I'm going to see reality for what it really is for the first time ever. And then stage five is I will be able to rule not others. It's not about dominating anybody else. It's about having total control over my own life. And then the final stage is resting. Not kind of just sitting back on my laurels, but realizing I have found a GPS system that's going to take me all the way home. I'm going to follow it to the end. And finally, a much longer one. It was a model I created many years ago. It's, I, I call it the 23 stages model or the 23 sacraments model. And the first one is, the first sacrament of all is God self-fracturing into individual uh, fractal souls. Stage two is souls now volunteer for incarnation in a variety of different worlds and dimensions. Stage three is the launching pad for, you know, where we leave the sight of God and we volunteer and parachute into other dimensions and other worlds. That's the third sacrament. The fourth sacrament for us on planet Earth is where the soul docks with the developing embryo or fetus. Now we're joining together. The, the spirit, the soul, is docking with a physical articulation of its mission. 
Number five, sacrament number five, is the birth and the first breath that the child takes after, after coming out of the womb. So it's called Ruach Yahweh, the Spirit of God. Sacrament number seven is the development or the arrival of the ego, the sense of separate self. And this happens around the age of eight months. Before that, the child is operating in what's called, in psychology, the mother-child complex. The child believes there's only one entity here, and I call the shots. I scream, a breast arrives. I scream, somebody cuddles me. And then around the age of eight months, the child begins to realize, holy God, there's not just one of us, there are two of us, and all the powers on the other side. I'm separate, and she has total control. And this is the beginning of the defense mechanism we put into place to try to level the playing field. I'm going to scream my head off, you know, and make her come back, or I'm going to be a real cuddly little baby, and she'll want to come back. Sacrament number seven is about age 8-1, where we become homo erectus, or learning to stand upright. Sacrament number eight, I believe, is around age 2. Now we become homo sapiens sapiens. We have a newfound ability to speak, to articulate our own thoughts. Number nine, having started off as crowd pleasers where, you know, we're to accept dada and mama and uh, they, they love us. But at age two, a little bit later, we say, no, me, mine. So already now we're creating the separation. Mother initially created the first separation at age eight when the ego developed and realized, you know, there are two of us, not one of us. Now the baby herself is creating the separation by saying, no, me, mine. They want separation. And that's part of the journey of incarnation. Sacrament number 10, I believe, is around age seven, where we learn to think rationally. And now society will impose rules and roles. Now that we're able to kind of think rationally, they're going to tell us what our role is in, in the family or in society and what the rules of society are. And now we're, we, become, we become ethnocentric beings. We're buying into a tribal belief system. Around age 12, we become sexually mature. And now we actually, we're conduit for other souls to incarnate into the world. And this stage is really tightly regulated by culture. Sacrament number 12, shortly afterwards, we develop the ability of self-reflection. Self-reflection is very different from just thinking. It is the ability to think about myself, about my motives. About, I can question my own performance and I can question the cultural values. Now I can challenge the tribal stories historical stories, theological stories, cosmological stories. I know we're moving from ethnocentric thinking, just about my tribe, to world-centric thinking. The next sacrament, number 13, I believe, is, is the first romantic friendship, puppy love, where the first time ever we were fascinated by somebody else and feel really attracted to them, want to be with them all the time. So the first romantic uh, puppy love. Sacrament number 14, I believe, is the first committed long-term relationship. Now, this is way beyond just kind of infatuation and puppy love. It is often leading to a, a socially sanctioned union where I want to spend the rest of my life with this person. Sacrament number 15, I believe, comes with the adoption of a profession. And now, this again is a world-centric mindset. So I, I want to add something to the, to the family of humanity. I want to be a value you know, by whether I'm a carpenter or a plumber or a psychologist or a bus driver, I'm trying to add to the societal needs. Sacrament number 16, I believe, is the birth of one's first child. And now we're going to regress from ethnocentrism and world-centric thinking because all of the attention is now focused on the newborn infant, my child and my, my little family. Number 17, I believe, sacrament number 17, is the birth of the first grandchild. And now there's an extended commitment again to protect and nurture all the children of the world. So we'll go back out to a world-centric uh, cosmology. And number 18, I believe, is the, um, the ability to embrace the entirety of life on the planet itself. Not just all the humans on the planet, but all life on the planet as well. To think, you know, cosmologically as a planetary system. Sacrament number 19, I believe, is enlightenment with the laughter at the illusion. And now you can really offer namaste to all sentient beings because now you've developed Christ consciousness. Now you have a permanent awareness of the divinity of all creatures and you're laughing at the illusion that we're separated from each other. Sacrament number 20 is the sacrament of death, of shuffling off this mortal coil, of disidentifying with the spacesuit and re-identifying with the soul self.
Number 21 is the Bodhisattva vow. Uh, deciding that you can't rest until all sentient beings learn to laugh at the illusion. So you're going to come back again and again and again because of compassion. Once more then, you're parachuting into incarnation. This is number 22. Sack number 22. You parachute back into incarnation where you're going to risk forgetting who you are. But the forgetting is merely a kind of a cryptamnesia. It dissolves very quickly. Cryptamnesia is where you, uh, you learn something, you think you're learning it from the first time, and then you realize, oh, I knew this before. So let, let's say you were born in a foreign country and you learned a foreign language. You know? And then at age four, everybody, everybody moved to America. And now in your 20s, you decide to pick up a foreign language and you pick up not knowing the language that you actually grew up with. And it comes to you really, really quickly. You've forgotten that you knew it, but it comes back really quickly. That's what happens when we reincarnate sufficiently. The uh, cryptamnesia that dissolves really quickly because I, I remember much faster who I was and why I came. So now you will accelerate through all of the stages. You're like um, a powerful way of recapturing the stranded water droplets from the beach of samsara and leading them back into the ocean heart of God. And then the final sacrament, number 23, is the game of Lila is done. All souls, all souls merge once more and there is only God. Namaste, my brothers and sisters. This relates to the beginning and the first homily of the month um, and the, um, I guess it's the separation and fall uh, story in, in Genesis and the recognition of their uh, nakedness. And um, there's a complementary theory, and I'm trying to figure out how all this fits into your 23 sacrament approach and, the, and, and God holographically fractalizing. <laughs> um, the, you know, St. Ignatius said pride is the first sin. And so the, the theory is that uh, Adam and Eve, uh, by the misuse of their free will, uh, um, thought that God knew something that they didn't, which they wanted to know. And just by that act, they separated themselves from God because they had to see him as a separate entity from themselves. And that therefore, when they recognized their nakedness, that was really the first instance of self-awareness or self-consciousness. Right. Nothing yeah. to do with sex or gender or anything like yeah. that. And so, um, apparently they were naked in the Garden of Eden and never noticed but now all of a sudden they're noticing their, their separation. And that seems like a willful act on their part to separate, yet the way it's presented in the Bible, it sounds as if the, the devil made them do it and then God kicked them out of heaven when in fact they separated themselves. And so I'm wondering how that lines up with the whole God fractalizing and us voluntarily choosing incarnation. Right. right. So the beauty about stories, Tom, which is why the Bible and Jesus particularly will always use parables, is that stories are not just informational, they're transformational. The, the, uh, the objective of every story is not to inform somebody of a whole bunch of facts. It is try to transform their thinking and their, per their perceptions. So the beauty of any story, you can take any story at any period and you can unpack it depending on where you are at in your own spiritual journey and what needs of yours it is offering to you. And so I've defined many, many times the difference between truth and fact. You know, I said that something can be true but not factual and something can be factual but not true. Because my definition of truth is that something is true if it transforms me and aligns me with God. Yeah? And something is radically true if it transforms me completely and kind of aligns me permanently with God. So truth is about the transformational ability of a storyline. And the Bible is just full of stories. So the question then becomes, as the reader approaches this material and any particular story in the Bible, how can you use that transformationally? What is bringing you closer to God? What is pushing you into fear and separation? And so different great, great scholars throughout human history have taken this story. Carl Jung is very famous for his interpretation of the fall. He believed that the fall was absolutely necessary in order to develop the uh, ability to, to discern, not just to be kind of pre-programmed robots. So a lot of great thinkers have taken this story and unpacked it. So my unpacking is that um, in order to experience 
uh, free will as distinct from freedom, there have to be choices among which we make. And the choices always lie on a spectrum between, you know, service to self at one end and service to other at the other end. So all of our choices are going to lie somewhere on that spectrum. Am I basically concerned about me, my reputation, my food, my clothes, whatever? Or am I concerned about other people? You're in this situation right now, Tom, in Asheville, where you're, you know, extending yourself for a community that has been devastated by a hurricane. So uh, in other words, where are each one of us along that spectrum? So free will then is the ability to do as I please, whereas freedom is the ability to do as pleases God. Uh, but God did not want robots. He didn't want kind of pre-programmed robots following a, a script and a particular plot. God wanted people to learn how to love in all kinds of vicissitudes. And you personally, Tom, have written a lot of powerful stuff about uh, the importance of pain. You quoted Richard Rohr many times, and you quoted uh, St. Francis of Assisi many times. The importance of pain, the ability to deal with vicissitude and harvest it anyway for growth and for compassion. So the beauty of these stories is that there's not just one articulation or one interpretation of it, which is kind of sacrosanct, you know, by any group. It is wherever you are in your spiritual journey, go back to the story and then see where does it lead you now. Yeah. Great question, Tom. I was thinking about, um, like, going from just... Yeah. Centering on self, selfishness, taking care of ourselves, and then um, being of service to others. Um, I kind of see it like with um, becoming family, too. As, as a mother, first you're just totally concentrated on your own child and um, and your family and the survival of, you know, just your family. Yep. And then... Um, I, I remember one time I was walking with my kids and I heard someone yell, mom, uh -huh. not my child. And I turned around and I looked and I, I started realizing I'm mom, not just to my kids, but to, yes. but to other kids too. Yes. And then many years later, when you know after i was a grandmother i'm in the store and someone yells out grandma and i look <laughs> it's like i i'm and i right. just saw now it it's like we we go from just concern about ourself and our own our own family our own grandchildren to to you know as a woman being maternal to the wider world, you know, not just yeah. my children and grandchildren. So I, I just saw that. Um, I just, I just saw that just now in your explaining um, that it's like an aha an awakening. And, That's, um, That's, That's brilliant. Denise. So, I mean, you can parcel it up any way you like, but another very simple way is to look at it, that there's four great stages. There's we're born, you know, egocentric, totally focused on self. And then we move at age seven into kind of ethnocentricity. We're part of a tribe, our affiliation is to the tribe. And then at some stage we become uh, geocentric or we are concerned for the world itself and all its denizens. And then finally we become cosmocentric, where we're not just denizens of one planet, we're denizens of the entire cosmos. And the heart is big enough. You know, the brain may be not big enough, but the heart is big enough to kind of accept and to grow into all those stages. So that's a beautiful illustration that a single word, mama or grandma, is able to kind of activate and trigger that response from you, that you're, you're spreading your love and your compassion into a much wider arena. Beautiful. Thank you. Keeping with the creation story, or at least the way we've been taught it as children and as Catholics, um, I'm trying to make sense of it. Um, I, the, at least my conception of God is uh, I I can't see how that would make sense if God doesn't want me to eat from the tree of knowledge and and know um, and be able to choose between good and evil. Huh? But, but then I also um, look at um, for centuries how. Catholic Church did not, it was almost um, a sacrilege to read the Bible yourself yes. before yes. before yep. the printing press was invented. And, and so that's almost like they, they, we were um, we were forbidden to 
be able to read those words ourself and and really um, almost read between the lines and find the mystical meanings of all these mm-hmm. stories um, in that great book. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I I don't have any. Uh, I still take my mother to Catholic church. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'll ever darken the doors of a Catholic church again when she's not able to go. Nothing against um, um, people who practice Catholicism at all. Um, but it's you know, over the course of trying to really choose my own conception of God and then seeing how we're almost manipulated by institutionalized religion yeah. and, and told this is what you better believe or you're going to hell. Yep. pretty much and the, uh, a fear-based religion really is um what i um don't subscribe to anymore right i heard you, you you built a whole bunch of questions into into that one statement so let me just suggest a few of them firstly you mentioned about uh, free will you know the ability to choose between uh, good and, and evil and that's vital because otherwise we're just automatons we're kind of robots pre-programmed to respond in a particular fashion and so uh, obviously uh, there's no growth involved in that. So uh, we have to have the ability to make the choices. Otherwise, love is not possible. You can't love unless you're free. Uh, and you're not free unless there are choices among which you can choose. So that becomes really, really important. That's one piece you're saying. The second piece then is how that you know, religion, that great insight that God is love, gets institutionalized into dogmatic fear. And I created a model for myself looking at, and this is true not just of religious organizations, it's true of any group. It's, tr- it's true of NGOs. It's true of the political system. It's true of economic models. You know that you all start off, they all start off with some great uh, mystical impulse. Very often you get a, an avatar figure, like a Buddha figure or a Jesus figure uh, or a Mother Teresa figure. This extraordinary uh, avatar figure, really charismatic. And uh, her teachings are really kind of, you know, uh, kind of inspirational. So a group of people gather around you know, the, the avatar. So that's stage two. Stage three is almost inevitably the avatar is going to be assassinated. Almost inevitably. Because the powers that be don't want any kind of competition. So uh, assassination is the next stage. The, ne- the fourth stage is that the followers now organize themselves into some kind of an, uh, a community. That's stage four. Stage five is almost inevitably some self-appointed oligarch will get to the top of the pile, you know, and start creating the rules for the rest of us. Stage six is that they now create a kind of a dogmatic creedal formulation, which you have to sign off on in order to be a member of our group. You know, you have to say, I believe in, and then they'll tell you what you need to believe in. And if you don't, you're out. And if they have the the power to do it, they're going to create an inquisition and torture you because you don't believe. And if they have military ability, they're going to create inquisitions and they're going to create crusades and kill other people. And then at some stage, a new avatar arrives that says, this is now what the teacher was talking about. You got a Francis of Assisi in the 1200s saying, you know, this is not what Jesus was about. And he confronts the Pope at the time in the 1200s. And he's, he creates this new group of people who are dedicated to compassion and to poverty. But in 300 years, the Franciscans are in charge of the Inquisition. They're literally tearing people limb from limb. So you get the same trajectory again and again and again. So where are we at that stage in this cycle? And how do you break out of that? Now, the final part of what you said is, there is a value in community. The one good, two great things the Catholic Church was able to do, it created community, and we need community. But community should do two things for us. It should, uh, it should encourage us in our search for truth, and it should challenge us in our current belief systems. And we need to do that for the organization as well. And the second great thing it used to do was created liturgies which were creating altered states of consciousness, which were appealing to all the senses. You had stained glass windows, you know, appealing to the eyes. You had the vestments the priest was wearing. You had incense engaging the olfactory sensorium. You had um, the music, you know, the auditory. So all of the senses were being activated in order to create an altered state of consciousness in which people could have individual mystical experiences. But we've lost that completely. Even our liturgies have gone flat. So, and community has been about, you know, kind of a cult rather than kind of a ability to, to challenge. And so again and again and again, there need to be prophets that break out of the system. And it's not just that there are individuals who are prophets for the rest of us. It is that every, every single one of us must be a prophet to ourselves. 
We must have the courage to do what Thomas said in his in his in his gospel, the Gnostic gospel. Search until you find. Then you're going to be really upset by what you find, break through anyway, and then you're going to be in admiration of what you've discovered, and you're going to rule and you're going to rest. And so this is the mission of every individual human being. We can't be dependent upon prophets from elsewhere to wake us up. Mm-hmm. Every one of us is sent as a prophet, and particularly if you have the uh, if you have the privilege as you have, Joe with your newest granddaughter. Every single child born among us is a prophet or a prophetess. We're meant to watch what they're doing and how they're doing what they're doing. Look at their sense of awe, their ability to forgive, their lack of prejudice, their ability to ask the really, really good questions and, and do that. So God is trying to say, oh, you have How many more kids do I have to send you before you wake up and realize, you know, that you're following your outdated thinking? So she's going to be the best teacher you're going to find in the next three or four years, yeah. Okay. Years ago, I read this somewhere, and it had a profound effect on me. And I think it was it was a Sufi idea, but I'll just run it by. Um, that the devil is God's most humble servant. And as as you might say, as the devil affected us in the Garden of Eden and got us out of the Garden of Eden and forced us to become a more mature relationship with God, that that in a way these mistakes we make and the evil in our world forces us to grow to another level if we're to survive. And I, I guess I think of this every time I run into a really hard spot and I'm inclined to slip backwards, uh, that this this division from God is like a child becoming divided from the parent. It has to learn to live uh, with what it inherited from the parent, but take it to another level. Anyway, what do you think? Yeah, so it's a very important question. It's the, the most ancient uh, problem in theology. It's called the theodicy problem. So the, the problem of evil. Now, we have to distinguish, Marty, between kind of the opportunities given us by the devil and the kind of motivation of the devil, whoever yes. the devil happens to be. So, yes. for instance, nobody volunteers to be Hitler and come down and murder six million Jews. Nobody volunteered for that so that six million Jews could have the opportunity you know, of finding God anyway. So there's a huge difference between the opportunities afforded us by the kind of the demonic you know, energies that we encounter and the intentionality of those demonic figures. Uh, years ago, a few years ago, uh, I seeded my, one of my dreams and I asked for a kind of a, I wanted to differentiate between sin and evil. And the question, well, the response I got to my question was this. Sin is the individual transgression of a culturally created precept. In other words, sin is just the breaking of a law made by human beings. Evil is a cosmic conspiracy using human yeah. intermediaries to separate souls from the source. And there literally is a cosmic conspiracy separating on planet Earth right now souls from God. Every possible way they can do it. Separation yeah. of families, yeah. destruction of father-child relationships, you know, destru- this cultural reasons, racist reasons. Everywhere you look, there's an, there's a, an effort to kind of cleave us and separate us from who we really, really are. That's a real thing. So you can't say that's good in the sense that the motivation behind it is good, but the opportunity afforded by it is really good. So again, we have to differentiate between the simplistic thinking that the bad people are really the good people because they volunteered for the hard roles. They didn't volunteer to be uh, to be uh, Hitlers in the world. You know, they came in with who they were. They did what they did, and now we find ourselves in a situation: how are we going to respond to what they've created and what we've created? So very, very important that we not confuse motivation with invitation. Yeah. Thanks, Marty. Sean, thank you. Four wonderful, thank fantastic you. Uh, homilies over the last month. Uh, and I, I jotted a few things down, but I yeah. promise there's a, there's a question here, you know, at the end of it, right? Uh, now, uh, uh, the law of karma, right. this, this is your first, your first talk. The law of cause and con- consequences, right? Nice. Now, our solar system and our Earth incarnated before yes. human beings came upon the Earth. Am I right in saying that, right? Yes. yes, absolutely. Now, my question is this, and it comes from Rudolf Steiner, right? He says, yes. Yes. the influence of karma has not only on individual lives, 
but the whole of human evolution. We might say that individual lives has a lesser karma and then a greater karma is active in the earth and human evolution. So if we are exploiting the resources of Mother Earth Gaia, do you think we're at the stage now, the equilibrium is tipping over the consequences and Mother Earth will take it upon itself to act? Can, can, can you grasp that, what I'm saying? Yes, I can get to it, yeah. Are you going to have an answer now? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'm totally convinced, you know, I, I shared a few months ago, Billy, a kind of a, a visionary experience I had about two years ago, where I saw God self-fracturing into these nets, so it seemed, into these bite-sized pieces of self, into these souls. And then God called what I call the first conference of the first synod. And God said, let's do something kind of fun together. What can we do together? Source and souls. And we decided to co-create a cosmos. So we co-created a cosmos. And now we're kind of, we're kind of um, observers, our witnesses of this glorious thing that we've created. But there was a second conference called Sometime Later, in which we decided, can we go even deeper? And the decision was, let's create avatars so that we can actually inhabit you know, the cosmos from within, not just observe it from without. It's the difference in cultural anthropology between being a kind of a, a witness of a culture and being a witness participant in a culture. So let's be participants as well as witnesses. And so we, had, we adopted particular kinds of spacesuits. In your case, in my case, it was a three-dimensional spacesuit. In other cases, it was a globe or a planet or a Milky Way galaxy. So there are various levels of incarnation. And so I think really great souls got to animate much bigger systems than you and I. I just got to animate this thing that I call Sean. You know, I think a great soul, I call it a Mahatma, uh, volunteered to animate planet Earth. I think that a greater soul volunteered to animate our solar system. I think a still greater soul volunteered to animate the Milky Way galaxy. And so all the ways up, there are levels of soul beings you know, who are volunteering, you know, to kind of animate a whole great system. Now, with evolution comes not only greater power, but greater temptation as well. So the fact that you've got extraordinary technological abilities or a tremendous intelligence does not necessarily mean that you're always going to use that for selfless reasons. As all the ways up and all the ways down, there's this uh, pull between free will which is the ability to do whatever, whatever the hell I want, and freedom, which is the ability to do what, what God wills. And so at each stage then, every, every part of that system has the ability and the kind of, the, uh, the kind of the responsibility to self-protect, to not allow itself to be destroyed. So to answer your question directly, is the great soul that inhabits planet Earth at this stage, is, is she likely to kind of uh, create a situation that will shuffle off human beings or shake them off you know, or hide like a dog freeing itself from a bunch of fleas. It's possible. It's possible, in fact, that the, uh, the solar system itself and maybe the cosmos at some stages has radically reass reassessed and redistributed life on planet Earth. There have been cometary strikes of various kinds that have wiped out, for instance, 90% uh, of life on planet Earth at various stages and repopulated it with much more glorious kinds of things. So is it possible that the great spirit, the great soul animating uh, Gaia right now could say, okay, you know, human beings aren't working. You know, they're really, they're really difficult. So I'm going to, I'm going to shake them off like a dog shakes off space. It's possible. The question is, can enough of us wake up quickly enough to kind of convince Mother Earth, you know, you know, you don't have to go to those drastic needs. There are people here who understand you and are in alignment with your mission. Brilliant question, Billy. Just feeding off of what uh, Billy said and, and your response, Sean, um, what's going on in, in Asheville right now, or what happened with the hurricane, uh, to me is an example of um, Mother Earth being sick and vomiting. And so I think we're getting a lot of warning signs from Gaia that what we're doing isn't okay, and if we keep doing it, <laughs> there could be a bigger correction ahead. Yeah, I agree with you. And there are lots of dangers with that because 
there are some people, you know, and some energies that are prepared to kind of actually amplify and accelerate, you know, the damage that's been done to planet Earth, other forces. So we have to be really, really careful that it's not just Mother Earth herself, rightfully trying to re recorrect, but that there are people who see this as an opportunity or forces that see this as an opportunity to actually dig the knife in deeper.